Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, let us start our lecture. So, um, in, okay, the whole chapter five basically talk about sampling distribution of something. So, uh, basically, we have a population, and the population behavior can be described by certain distribution. can be described by a certain distribution, all right? And uh, some of the characteristics, such as the population mean and the population variance, all right, uh, may be known, or are those characteristics that we're interested in. So naturally, we'll like to know how the distribution, be, how, how the population behaves and some of the characteristics of the population. So. Uh, what we can do is to take a sample, another sample, a third sample, and so on. So uh, in order to know something about the population mean, is naturally we look at the sample mean. So sample mean basically is the average of all the, um, the values or the, the random variables in the sample. So a random sample sometimes referred to as uh, a set of n random variables. So each individual in the sample is denoted by a random variable xi. So xi basically is considered as one of those individuals in the population. The population can be infinite, it, uh, consists of infinite individuals. All right? So, um, so this, this x1 up to xn are random variables. Therefore, x bar is also a random variable. You can interpret this x bar as a random variable in the following way. You can consider that you take many samples. So x bar uh, obtained from each sample. So you have a, a, a large number of uh, x bar values and they behave uh, how they behave. So we can describe it by distribution. So X bar is the distribution. What is the distribution of X bar? So you can interpret as how the set of a big number of samples, each one you calculate X bar and how this set of X bar behaves, so it's a distribution. Or you can interpret it as the X bar, all right, as a fun, uh, X bar is one over N submission XI, where XI x1 up to xn are the random sample. So x bar is a function of a set of random variable. So this again is a random variable. Remember a random variable means that it is a variable and associated with, with each value of the random variable, there's a, a number to measure either the probability or the probability density. All right, so we have the distribution of the random variable, all right, x bar. So this is how we, and in fact, this uh, x1 up to xn, they are taken from the, from the population. So each of this x1 up to xn, they are follow, each of them follows the same distribution as the distribution of the population. So if the populations have a distribution like this, all right, then each of the xi follow the same distribution. And in fact, all the xi's are independent, are independent as well. All right. So sometimes we refer x1 up to xn are independent, identically distributed random variables. All right. Okay. So um, so we talk about uh, the distribution of x bar. We also talk about the distribution of um, the difference of these two. So this one, if if x one is taken from a population, the x one one up to x one n one, taken from a normal distribution with mean mu one and sigma one square, 
and x21 up to x2n2 taken from a normal distribution, a population follow normal distribution with sigma 1, uh, mu 1, sorry, mu 2 and sigma 2 square. Then x bar 1, the average of all this, follow a normal distribution with the same mean, but the variance is like that. And this one follow normal mu sigma 2 square over n2. So x1 bar minus x2 bar, okay, will follow, ah, they are independent, huh? which means that not just x11, x12 up to x1n1 are independent, but any of these random variables are also independent from any of the x2i. All right, so in that case, then the difference between the two means will follow a normal distribution with mu1 minus mu2 as the mean and sigma1 square over sigma2 square over n2. All right, so that is the distribution for x1 bar over x2 bar. Now, all this, this and also this one, all this assuming that x1, x2, xn, this is a random sample taken from a normal distribution. All right? Then naturally you asked, so what happens if the population does not follow a normal distribution? All right? Then, then, then what is the distribution of x bar? The random sample. That means 1 over n summation x summation xi, what is the distribution of this quantity? All right, so we don't know the distribution, we don't know whether it's normal or not, then we are asked, what is the distribution of x bar? So we have this powerful theorem called central limit theorem, which simply saying that, okay, if you have a random sample, means that your x1 up to xn are, um, uh, each of them are taken from the population, so they're identically and independent uh, random variables, so the sample mean will follow um, will follow approximately a normal distribution with the mean mu and variance sigma square over n, and provided that your sample size is big. All right. So uh, that's the central limit theorem. So if the underlying distribution it's not normal, but we know that it's close to normal. Then we can still can still apply this result. All right. Only that because your underlying is underlying distribution is approximately normal, so x bar is approximately normal. But if we don't know the underlying distribution, that means we don't know the population's distribution. If your sample size is big enough, then your your x bar still follow approximately the normal distribution. So what you have to figure out what is the mean and what's the variance. So the mean is equal to, this one is the expectation of each of the xi, each of the ex expectation of each of the xi. And the variance is just the variance of each of the xi divided by n. All right, this is the mean, this is the variance. All right, so um, remember sample size big enough does not mean that your sample values, it does not mean that x1, x2 up to xn follow normal distribution. What the central limit theorem say is the sample mean, that is x bar, that follow normal distribution approximately. If you have problem, remember this example. Think of it, I have a population, infinite number of them, but only have two distinct values. 0 and 1. So the chance of having a 1 is p and the chance of having 0 is 1 minus p. And I have infinite number of them in this population. So I take a sample of a million. So I take from this infinite population 1 million of them. So even these 1 million values, they're still either 0 or 1. Look at all these 0 and 1, how can they follow a normal distribution? So even with a sample of size 1 million, the, the sample values do not follow a normal distribution. But while you consider your mean, 
All right. That means I take one million values to have zero and one, I take the average. So add up all this one million value, divide by one million. All right, so I have one mean. Take another sample of one million. So I calculate the mean again. And take a third sample of a million and calculate the mean again. Then all these means, uh, if I have enough, a large number of samples uh, of each of one million, then all these sample mean will follow approximately a normal distribution. All right? It's the sample mean that follow normal distribution, approximately. All right, then the, we also introduced or we discussed uh, two more new distributions of one is chi-square, the other one is t-distribution. All right? So uh, you have to be aware of uh, what are the parameters, all right? And um, uh, what are the properties about all these distributions? So one um, important um, property is that if you have a chi-square, which is, sorry, if you have a standard normal random variable and you have, um, you, you square it, then this will have a chi-square one. So this is the first, okay, the first properties. Second properties is that if you have w each of this follow a chi-square with degrees of freedom n i, then the sum of y i, i from one to n, that means y one plus y two plus y three, and so on, will follow a chi-square with degrees of freedom of the parameter equal to the sum of the parameters here. Of course, I forgot to mention, it has to be independent. The y's are independent. All right, so that's the sum of the properties about chi-square distribution. All right. Um, why is so um, useful? There are many reasons, but at least we discuss one sampling distribution. All right, remember, I just mentioned we talk about sampling distribution of x bar. So naturally, we'll ask what is the sampling distribution of the sample variance. But we do not address this directly. Instead, we look at this distribution. Okay, this is still a random variable, so we can talk about the distribution of this quantity, which is n minus 1 s square over sigma square. This follow a chi-square distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. So in other words, x bar, okay, we have this central limit theorem, or even if we know that the data, the, the population is normal, or the x1 up to xn are from normal distribution, then the x bar will follow uh, a normal distribution. Well, n minus one s square over sigma square will follow a chi-square distribution, provided that your, your random sample is taken from a normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance sigma square. All right? Then the, we also talk about T distribution. T distribution, um, in fact, T distribution is considered as the ratio of a standard normal divided by, uh, okay, Z is standard normal and u is a chi-square with n degrees of freedom. So it can be considered as the ratio of two random variables. One is the standard normal, the other one is the square root of the random variable divided by, by um, n, the degrees of freedom. Why we have such thing? Because there's this quantity, x bar minus mu over sigma over root n, this is standard normal. And on the other hand, we also have m minus one s square over sigma square, which is a chi-square n minus one degrees of freedom. All right, so if I take the ratio, then I don't need to know what sigma is. So if I take the ratio of the two, or take the ratio of this quantity, n minus one s square over sigma square, and the whole thing divided by n minus one, I just copy this thing here. Sorry, uh, sigma square over n. All right, square root, square root. So I just copy, this is the standard normal, this is the square root of chi-square over uh, the degrees of freedom. So after you simplify it, it turns out to be something like this. All right, 
So it follows a T distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom because it's a standard normal divided by the square root of the chi-square over the degrees of freedom. So in other words, we know the distribution of x bar if the underlying distribution is normal, even if they're not normal, applying the Centauri limit theorem, we got the distribution of x bar. We also would like to know what's the distribution of x s square. But instead of s square, we look at m minus 1 s square over sigma square, which follow a chi square distribution. Then we also have this x bar minus mu over, instead of sigma, we replace it by s. So by doing so, we have, uh, we know that it follow a distribution called a T distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right. So all this new distribution that we discussed, so you have to know what is the expectation and what is the variance, all right, and how they link to the parameters. So for example, for chi-square, the expectation of x, if x follow a chi-square, then expectation of x is equal to n and variance of x equal to 2n. For t distribution, the expectation, if t follow a t distribution, then expectation of t equal to 0 and variance of t equal to n over n minus 2. All right. Okay. Then, the, of course, all these are the properties about this distribution, how we use it to describe the sampling distribution of some statistics or some, some uh, something, some values from the, some random variable uh, for the sample. You also have to know, at least for, you always like to ask the exam, right? So you need to know how to use the tables to get the values, all right? So, um, of course, if you have a calculator, you can do it, but you better know how to interpret all this or get the values from a statistical tables. All right, for example, I want to know, I want to know, so for example, if this is a T distribution with let's say 10 degrees of freedom, I want to know, find the value here such that greater than this value, the probability is 5%. Or I may find a value, all right, B, such that less than this value is 1%. So what are these values? All right. So how to do it in the, the finding all this? So here's how we can do it. So uh, I upload the tables and you should have, a, you should be able to have a copy all right, so, so this is a table for the t values, all right, and um, just now we want to have, uh, all right, so, um, all right, so just now I want to ask what is the probability of a t 10 degrees of freedom Annotator. All right, so uh, open. Okay, so T tables. Okay, so this is the T table. Now you read the description carefully. So what it tells you is that these are the various uh, T distribution. So this is the one related to a T distribution with 10 degrees of freedom. And what it says is that, okay, for a T distribution with 10 degrees of freedom, this value, 0.6998, for which the probability greater than this value is equal to 25% for 0.6998, all right? So just now I say that I want to find an A such that, find an A here, such that this probability is 5%. So what is it? So we look at this is the 5%, so this is the value that I'm looking at, 1.825, right? So this is the value saying that for a t distribution with 
10 degrees of freedom, and the chance greater than this value is 5%. All right? So I just asked, what is the chance that less than a value with 1% chance? So there's no such thing as less than 1%. But remember, T distribution is symmetrical, so you just look for greater than 1%, which is this value, 2.7638. So in other words, so this value, 2.7638, the chance greater than it is 1%. So therefore, less than a value, find a value less than that is 1%. So this value should be minus 2.7638 because it's symmetrical about zero. All right? Okay. So how about if I want to find a value such that the probability of a T distribution with 10 degrees of freedom greater than it is, let's say, 0 0.4, 0 0.04, let's say, 0 0.04, 0 0.04. Then what is it? So I try to look for, I don't have 0 0.04, I have only 0 0.05 and 0 0.025. Okay, so in other words, this C must somewhere between these two values, right? Because what we are saying is that, okay, for this value, 1.8125, it is 5% less and uh, greater than it. For this 2.2281, the chance greater than it is 2.5%. So a C must be somewhere here. So that chance of greater than C is 4%. Uh, uh, 4%. So we only know that it's between these two. All right, so that's first thing that we know. You, if, if you want to get a number, all right, approximate value for C, so what you can do, at least you can take the average of these two numbers. So in other words, I, I, I may not able to exactly identify the probability or, or the value C such that it's exactly 4%. I just take the in between these two, two values so that the probability of greater than that number is somewhere between 0 0.05 and 0 0.025. All right. Of course, if you want to be more, uh, get a better approximation, you may do something called linear interpolation. So basically, you just take the ratio. All right. See, 4%, how far is it from 5%, and 4%, how far is it from 2.5%. It seems that 4% is closer to 5%. So you put more weight to this 1.8125. So it's just a linear interpolation, all right? So you can do a linear interpolation. You can just take the average of these two values. And the third approach is even simpler. So you just take the nearest. So 4%, okay, then I take the 5% the, uh, one. All right. It depends on the problem or what you want, all right? But uh, at least I know that I cannot tell you what I see, but C should be greater than 1.8125. All right. So that's how we use the table. So for T distribution, for chi square distribution, one row represents one T or chi square distribution. Unlike the normal distribution, all right, normal distribution, you have one, one table for only one normal distribution. It is the standard normal distribution, all right? Okay, and also you notice that, so these are the degrees of freedom for the T distribution. Then after 30, a jump of 40, 50, a jump of 10 degrees of freedom. So the last one, infinity. So although infinity is just a notation, a symbol. But what it means is that when the degrees of freedom getting bigger and bigger, the T distribution is closer to a standard normal distribution. So therefore, this simply means that, uh, okay, a T distribution with degrees of freedom N and when limit, M L I M, limit of N goes to infinity, this approach to a standard normal so in other words, this, this line represents the quantile of 
a standard normal distribution. So you can go and go back and check. For example, this number, 1.96 under 0.025. So in other words, the chance of greater than 1.96 is 2.5%. That is for standard normal or T distribution with a degrees of freedom that is going to infinity. All right? Okay. So, uh, Ah, so you can practice uh, how to use the Excel based on these commands, all right? Um, I don't think you will be asked how to use Excel, but that this is for you to, to use to get your T value, the quantile, or the, prob the cumulative probability. All right, okay, so let's look at some examples. So this manufacturer of light bulbs claims that his light bulbs will burn on the average 500. So in other words, so we consider all the light bulbs by this manufacturer, all right, and it claimed that the average uh, lifetime, all right, is 500. So he tests 25 light bulbs each month and then compute this quantity. So, so in other words, every month you try to take a sample of 25, look at the, the survival time, or how, how, how long it will burn out. So, and then the, also get the sample standard deviation, apply this formula. This formula is the one that we mentioned earlier. It is x bar minus mu over s over root n. n is the sample size, 25. All right, now then, so if this compute value from that sample fall between uh, this quantity and this quantity, what is this quantity? This quantity means that you're looking at a T distribution with 25, uh, 24 degrees of freedom. All right. Uh, it's just one less than your sample size. It's N minus one, uh, remember. N minus one for, for the T distribution. So uh, look at this value. This is my T. 24.05, which means that the chance greater than this probability is 5%, 5%. So this is just the mirror image on the other side. So it's negative T24.02.05, 0 0.05, all right? So what it claims that, okay, so, so if, if the, this quantity, you got the sample, calculate x bar, calculate s, substitute in, and if the value falls between these two n numbers, then he say that, he believes that his claim is a valid claim. That means mu, the, what is the claim? The claim is mu equal to 500. All right? All right. So, now, now we draw a sample and calculate, and the sample mean is 518 and the sample, uh, the sample deviation is 40. Okay, um, okay, to be more consistent, I think maybe we better use lower case. All right, um, okay, let me put it this way. Capital letter represent random variable. So when I have capital letter X bar, okay, this is a random variable. It is this one. All right. So x1, x2, up to xn, all these are random variables. And x1 represent you take a one from the population. So in other words, x1 can be a light bulb, the, the, the time, the survival time or the lifetime of a light bulb, the first one in a sample. x2 is the lifetime of the of the second light bulb, all right? This one is before you, you, you measure, you get the lifetime. It just represents that, okay, I take a sample with n light bulbs, or in this case, 25 of them. X1 represents the outcome of the first light bulb, and the second, uh, X2 represents the outcome or the lifetime of the second light bulb. But then once you 
measure it, measure it, then it represents by the lower case. All right? So once you measure it, here I did not give you all the value of x1, x2. I just give you the average. All right? That is after you measure it, so you got the number. All right? So uh, I hope you try to clarify with a capital letter, the notation capital letter means it's a random variable. All right? So when you take a sample, if you don't look at it, okay, for example, I take a, a sample of uh, 10 students from this class, okay, then the average is x1 over 10 divide, uh, 1 over 10 times x1 plus x2 up to x10. So that is the sample mean. But in order to get the value of this particular sample, I have to measure everyone's height. So I have to get the realization of the random variable x1. So like toss a coin, it's either head or tail. Before I toss it, I don't know whether it's head or tail. But once I, I toss it, then I will know it's a head or it's a tail. So I will have a realization. Once I toss it, I got the result, there are no more random variable. I will see the outcome. So once I measure the height of that individual in the sample, I have the realization of the value. All right, so once you got the realization, draw this sample and get this x bar equal to 518 and s equal to 40. And we also assume that the x, all right, follow approximately normal. So in other words, the x1 up to x25, each of these represent the lifetime of the light bulbs, all right, 25 of them, each will follow a normal distribution. And what is the mean? The mean is mu and the variance is sigma squared. All right. So now if we have this one, then the this quantity here will follow a t distribution. So from the table, we find that this quantity is 1.711. So in other words, we, the manufacturer is happy with his claim if we compute your x bar minus mu s over root n, all right, falls between these two numbers. If it's outside, what does it mean? It means that it means that your mu may not be 500, all right. So we we compute it, and it turns out to be two 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 point two five. What does that mean? It means that it is beyond the range. So the manufacturer say that, okay, if it is one point, the realization of this quantity, if it lies between uh, 1.711 and minus 1.711, then we say that, ah, mu is, mu equal 500, that's his claim. His claim is okay. But once it go beyond it, is here or is here, then something wrong. Not something wrong. His claim is not a valid one. We have doubt about his claim. Why? Because the way that we compute the t is look at the difference between the sample mean and the claim, the population mean. So, so if the if the x1 up to x 25, each follow a normal with mean equal to 500, then we expect the sample mean should be very close to 500. We also divide by S over root N to, to make it a T distribution. But basically the idea is that, look at the difference. How big this difference between the X bar and the 500? If X bar is close to 500, then we believe that or uh, at least we don't have evidence to say that mu does not equal to 500. But if your x bar in this case is 518, we take a sample and got x bar equal to 518. Is it very different from 500? Only an 18, 18 difference, right? 500 and 18 minus 500, so a difference of 18. Is it big? So you cannot tell, but I can tell. Yes, it's big. Why? Because if I take into consideration the variation of the, the lifetime of the light bulbs, which reflect by the denominator S over root N, which is the estimate of the variance or standard deviation, standard error of the X bar. All right. So this, this, 
difference in fat is quite big because compared with egg. So it's 2.25. All right. So we come up with a, a, a value, 2.25, that we believe is big. All right. If, a big if, if mu equal to 500. So naturally we'll think that if I see something like that, I may suspect that the mu in fact is not 500. In fact, the manufacturer is underestimate, a uh, uh, claim, under claim is uh, the, the lifetime of the light bulb is even longer than 500 hours. All right. But on the other hand, if it turns out that this x bar minus mu over s over root n is somewhere here, within minus 1.711 and 1.711, then we think that his claim is reasonable. All right. But if this quantity turned out to be somewhere here, less than minus 1.711, what does that mean? It means that, because it's negative, it means that your x bar is much smaller than 500 in that sense. So he, his claim is not justified. All right, his, his, his light, his, the light bulb that he produced, he, he produced is really have a lifetime less than 500. All right, if your T value falls be, below minus 1.711. All right, so here, so uh, because it's greater than S, so it's likely that mu is greater than 500. That means his light, the, the, the light bulb that he manufactured his, his factory manufacturer uh, is, should have an average greater than 500 hours. All right. So we conclude that his claim is okay. In fact, his pops are a better product than he thought. All right. Because we believe that the mean is different from 500. Maybe 501, 502, 510. All right. What we can see from here is that we look at the difference between the sample mean and the, the population mean mu that he claims. All right. Okay. Um, so that's how we make use of the t distribution. And later on in uh, chapter six and chapter seven, we'll repeat this again based on the idea. All right. Now we have this population. We don't know the mu or we claim that the mu equal to 500. So I take a sample, a sample of 25 in this case, and then I look at x bar. Okay, the rationale is that, okay, I calculate x bar and see how far x bar from the mu that you claim. That means look at this one, that's the first step. Then the next step is that, is this big or small? So at this, for this particular sample, the difference is 18. So it's 18 big or small. Now you cannot use your, uh, your sense of big or small in terms of number. 18, well, big. But 18 is not big. So no, we are not comparing like that. We have to take into consideration the variation of the x or the sigma square. All right? Let me put it this way. If sigma square is equal to 1, what does that mean? Sigma square equal to one, what does that mean? That means each light bulb uh, its lifetime uh, is most likely to be around 500. Maybe 499, maybe not 498, or even 497. It seldom go below 497 and seldom go above 503. Three, remember three standard deviation from the mean. Most of the data will fall within three standard deviation about the mean. All right, so if sigma square is equal to one, then your 18 uh, is very, very big compared with the standard deviation. So it's really, really a very big difference. But let's say if sigma, sigma equal to 10, sigma equal to 10, then what does it mean? It means that your data, your life, lifetime of your light bulb, range from 470, majority will fall between 470 and 530, between this, this wide range. Then the average is, oh, okay, um, 
maybe maybe 30. Okay, so so after you take a sample of 25 and calculate the average, and the average is eight, sorry the difference. Calculate the difference between x bar and 500. Then it's 18. So is 18 big or not? All right. So in order to answer this question, I have to know how x bar behaves. How x bar behaves. So uh, more specifically, what is the standard deviation of x bar? We call it standard error. Basically, it's square root of the variance. So remember, just remember the. I say that if x follow normal with mean mu and sigma square. So now I presume mu is 500 and sigma is 10. Then what is the distribution of x bar? It will be normal. And what's the mean? Mu, right? So if mu is 500, this will be 500. Then how about the variation? What is it? Huh? 10 or sigma square or sigma square over n. Right? This is the, so in other words, it will be 10. Uh, if, if the standard width is 10, so it's 10 squared divided by, if the sample size is 25, so we'll divide by 25. All right, all right. So, uh, so that means x bar behaves follow a normal distribution with the center at mu. Now, let's say mu is equal 500. All right, we assume that it's 500. But if you are told that the sigma square is 10, then the variation of x bar will be will be sigma square over my sample size. My sample size in this example is 25. So it's 10 square over 25 which is 4. That means the variance of x bar is 4. And the standard deviation, the square root of the variance of x bar now becomes 2. What does that mean? It means that we expect the x bar to be somewhere around the mean, mu, okay, with three standard error from the, from the mean, which means that 3 times 2, so it's 6. So in other words, it will be 6 below 500 and 6 above 500. You can find majority of the x bar. Now your x bar is 18, 518, 18 away from the mean, if the mean is really 500. So what does it mean? It's very unlikely that the mu is really 500. If what you see, the x bar is 518, and presume that the variance is 10, the variance, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the sigma, is 10, or, or the variance 10 squared, all right? So uh, I will repeat this again when we talk about uh, statistical inference, but that's how, um, why we need to know the probability, how, why we need to know the sampling distribution. So we have to know how the, the quantity, like for example, this quantity, this t, all right, which is x bar minus mu over s over root n, how it behaves. So if follow a t distribution. All right. So now another new distribution called f distribution. All right. So what is f distribution? F distribution. All right. Um, is uh, a ratio of two random variable. Each follow a chi square distribution. All right. And they are independent. Independent. So chi square of n1 degrees of freedom adjust by the degrees of freedom and then compare with another chi square independent chi square random variable adjust by by n2 all right so um you see wh why we want to uh study this kind of distribution okay Let, let's look at this distribution first before we answer the question why we want to study it all right, so um, this is called F distribution, and the two parameters are N1 and N2, the degrees of freedom for this two chi-square distribution. All right, this is the PDF. You can see that, so complicated, but they're basically there are only three quantities, N1, N2, and X. X is the value of the, the random variable, and N1, N2, we call it parameters. All right, and what is N1, what is N2? N1 is the degrees of freedom for the numerator. If F is equal to U over N1 and V over N2. All right, so, so this is the degrees of freedom for U and N2 is the degrees of freedom for the denominator random variable. All right, 
and the expectation of x is n2 over n2 minus 2, and the variance is given by this. All right. So it's only valid for n2 greater than 2, and n. the variance formula is valid for n2 greater than 4. All right? So, so x or f is not a symmetric distribution. In fact, it only valid for, because this is a chi-square, this is a chi-square, both chi-squares, the range of u is 0 to infinity, range of v is from 0 to infinity, so you take the ratio of these two, adjust by the degrees of freedom, so again, f, the, the value, the range of this random variable is from 0 to infinity, all right, from 0 to infinity, that is for x bigger than 0. Okay, so um, what is it used for? So here I try to show you what, why we want to use this. Okay, suppose we have two population, two normal population. That means population one, the data follow a normal distribution with mu, mu one, mean mu one and variance sigma one square. Population two, normal with mean mu2 and variance sigma2 square. We take a sample, all right, and take a sample, then we calculate a statistic u, which is n1 minus 1 times s1 square over sigma1 square. This follow a chi-square with n1 minus 1 degrees of freedom. And similarly, take, consider the values from the second sample, calculate n2 minus 1 s2 square uh, divided by sigma2 square. Then, because they are from independent samples, so therefore, u over n1 minus 1, v over n2 minus 1, this one, if I call it f, it basically is equal to s1 square over s2 square, over sigma1 square and over sigma2 square. All right? So this follow a f distribution. So what does it mean? Remember, we talk about the distribution of x bar. We also talk about the sampling distribution of x1 bar minus x2 bar. x1 bar minus x2 bar. So, uh, right? So far we talk about x bar. We talk about x1 bar minus x2 bar. We also talk about, it's not exactly s square, but we are talking about this one, the distribution of this one. This is for one population. This is for two population or two samples. So similarly, you want to look at, you want to look at the two uh, variances. So instead of looking at something like this, right? Here, one sample x bar, two sample, we look at the difference. So one sample, me, uh, one sample variance, we look at this quantity. So why do we, when we look at the relationship between s1 square and s2 square, can we look at the difference? Okay, the answer is yes, you can look at it, but the problem is, what is the distribution of this difference? The difference is so complicated, uh, the distribution of the difference is so complicated, so we drop the idea, but instead we look at the ratio. Look at the ratio of, basically we look at the ratio of these two. But unfortunately we cannot, um, we cannot uh, get the distribution of this one, we can only get the distribution of this one. This is F distribution. But in particular, if I'm interested in whether the two population variants are the same, then what happened to sigma 1 square over sigma 2 square? One. So it disappeared. So basically, just look at the S1 square divided by S2 square. And how does this behave? It behaves like a F distribution. F distribution. With degrees of freedom N1 minus 1 and N2 minus 1. All right? So the purpose of this F distribution, or not purpose, but then this F distribution help us to answer the question whether 
to com how to compare the two sample variances. All right. There are two ways that you can compare. One is S1 square minus S2 square. Look at the difference. We don't use that because the distribution of S1 square minus S2 square is more complicated. So on the other hand, we look at the ratio. We look at the ratio. S1 square over S2 square. Okay? We don't know the distribution of S1 square over S2 square, but we know the distribution of S1 square over S sigma 1 square, and then the whole thing divided by S2 square over sigma 2 square. That follow a F distribution. All right. In fact, uh, most likely uh, when, we, when we look at it, compare the two means, mu 1 and mu 2. So the first thing that we would like to compare is whether mu 1 equal to mu 2. All right? So that's why we look at x1 bar minus x2 bar. So there's also for sample, sorry, for the population variance, sigma 1 square over sigma 2 square. So we would like to look at whether sigma 1 square equals sigma 2 square. So to translate it, either you look at, if you want to check this part, whether this is true or not, either you check this one, so naturally you will look at S1 square minus S2 square, which we are in doubt how to get the distribution. Alternatively, we, uh, this is equal to zero. Alternatively, we look at the ratio, equal to one or not. So we look at S1 square over S2 square. All right. So if the two variants are the same, then S1 square over S2 square will follow a F distribution. Then we compare, draw the sample, get the S1 square, realization of S1 square over S2 square, then check, compare with the F distribution. Then we can make a decision, okay, whether this is reasonable assumptions or not. If this turn out to be very big, compare the F distribution, then we suspect that sigma 1 square does not equal to sigma 2 square. All right, so that's the idea. Okay, so uh, here we, I do the algebra, then you can see that after you divide this cancel out, so we left with this S1 square over sigma 1 square and S2 square over sigma 2 square. So in particular, if sigma 1 square equal sigma 2 square, then the ratio of S1 square equal S2 square will follow a chi square, sorry, follow a F distribution with N1 minus 1, N2 minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right? Okay. Uh, this is something to do with the properties of F distribution. So if a random variable, uh, uh, a little bit confused about the notation. This referring to a random variable, I call it F. This one is a distribution, a F distribution with parameters M and N. All right, so that's what it means. And how about this one? Oh, sorry, N and M, uh, I follow this one. All right, so how about this? with a subscript here, pawn 0, 05. So this refer to, this, with, this is a constant. This is a, a constant, a value, let, let me call it A. So basically it refer to F distribution, N, M degrees of freedom. This is the value, all right, or F, pawn 05, N and M, such that the probability greater than this value is 5%, pawn 0, 05. So this is the notation that we use in these few chapters. So here, if F, capital F, it stands for random variable. If we have F with two uh, bracket with two arguments, they're referring to the parameters or the degrees of freedom of this F. So F uh, bracket N, M refer to a F distribution with degrees of freedom N and M. All right, so that's how. So now, it says that, okay, if a random variable f follow a f distribution, then the reciprocal 1 over f will follow a f distribution, but now the parameter is m and n, so we swap the parameters, all right? So um, here it's just follow from the definition, why? So think of it, f 
basically means that u over, over n and v over m, all right? Where u is a chi-square with n degrees of freedom and v is a chi-square with degrees of freedom m. So 1 over f, what is 1 over f? All right, 1 over f, let me write 1 over f. So it is v over m and u over n. I just have to reverse the numerator and the row of numerator and denominator. So it's like that. So this quantity follow a f distribution with degrees of freedom m and n. All right, so that's the result. That is, that properties follow from the definition of the, of the f distribution. All right, it is a ratio of two independent chi-square. So when you take one over f, you just swap the numerator and the denominator. That's why the degrees of freedom uh, also swap. All right? Now, so uh, how to read from the f tables? Uh, f uh, how to read from a statistics table about these f values? Now, so um, remember in the t and the chi-square tables, each row represents one distribution. All right? Now, in a two-dimension or two-way table, remember, now I have, I have, I have what? I have two parameters instead of one. In T distribution, there's only one, the degrees of freedom. In the chi-squared table, also degrees of freedom is one parameter, degrees of freedom. So each row represents a distribution. So now, how about F distribution? So here's the F distribution. So F table. So the row and the column represent the two parameters. So the row, all right, the row here represent the degrees of freedom in the denominator, all right, in the denominator. So this is F V1, V2. So this is the degrees of freedom for the denominator and this is for the numerator the degrees of freedom for the numerator. This is the degrees of freedom for the denominator. All right? So, in this case, instead of give you many quantiles, there are only three quantiles given to you. All right? So basically, if I'm looking at, for example, uh, F distribution with degree of freedom five and, uh, okay, uh, Let's say 8 and 5, 8 and 5. So I take V1 equal to 8 and then V2 equal to 5. So I look at this set of numbers. Okay, look at this set of numbers. I only have three values. So in other words, for F distribution with degrees of freedom 8 and 5, then the chance of greater than 4.82, 4.82 is 5%. The chance of greater than 6.76 uh, is 2.5%. The chance greater than this 10.29 is 1%. That's what you are given in this table. All right? How about, okay, so, so this, if I draw the graph, it will be something like this. So this is 4.82 for F distribution with degrees of freedom 8 and 5. So this probability is 5%. So 6.76 is here. So this probability is 2.5%. That's what we have. So let me ask you, what is the value here such that less than it is 5%? Less than it is five percent. Can we get it? So remember, I'm asking what's the probability of F M N less than let's call this value B such that it's equal to five percent. All right? And that there's no symmetric, huh? so we cannot take the mirror image. But because of this definition of F distribution, this is 
can be written as 1 over F M N, right, greater than B, right? Oh, sorry, 1 over B, 1 over B, all right, 1 over B, all right? Am I right? Huh? Am I right? Oh, I need your assurance, huh? just like you always ask me, right? So, am I right? If A bigger, if F big, uh, less than B, 1 over F must be greater than 1 over B. Right? Yeah. 3 bigger than 2. Right? 1 over 3? Greater or less than 1 over 2? Right? So you have to reverse the inequality. All right? But just now I told you, 1 over M N is the same as, okay, um, so 1 over, th this one can be considered as F N M, all right? I just swap, swap. So basically you are just looking, uh, looking at, remember what we, I just mentioned? I'm sorry, um, this one, all right? This property, uh, yeah. All right, so F follow F distribution with parameters N and M, then one over F is uh, M N. So now this one, all right, one over, so this is the same as F N M, swap the degrees of freedom greater than one over B, all right? Greater than one over B with 5%. So now I just look at V1, just now V1 is 8, so now V1 becomes 5, and then V2 becomes 8. So I look at this set of numbers. All right? All right? Then, the, what, 5%, right? 5% means this number, 3.58. But this is not B, huh? it's 1 over B equal to 3.58. So you have to take 1 over 3.58. All right? Okay, so in other words, probability of F58 uh, greater than 3.58 is equal to 5%. All right, so I have to equate this equal to 3.58. Therefore, B equal to 1 over 3.58. All right. So, in other words, you have to, the table only gives you the, the the other side, that means the left tail. The right tail, less than 1%, less than 2.5%, less than 5%, all this can be obtained by looking at another F distribution with degrees of freedom just swap, all right? So that's how we used the F table. So um, in Excel, the command is F.DST. All right, F dot DST. Uh, you, you can work it out yourself for all this. All right, so for the Excel, it is in the F dot DST. This RT means right tail. That means the probability greater than this value. All right, so give you the right hand probability. So this whole thing will give you these probabilities. Because you have to specify this is the value f, all right, and the degrees of freedom, then they will give you. So, for example, uh, f distribution with degrees of freedom 5 and 4, the chance greater than 6.26 is 5%. 5%. All right. The inverse, the inverse is given the p, given this, this part, try to figure out what is this f. So, that is the inverse. So all the functions, statistical function in Excel are like this. DIST help you to find the probability. All right. Some may be the right hand tails, some may be just the left hand tails, some may be both sides. All right. Uh, then um, for INV is given the probability, try to locate the quantiles, the value. Well, DIST gives you the value, try to locate the probability. 
All right. So this is the F table. Oh, this one is uh, better than than the one that I gave you. This one gives you four values according to what you say. It's um, it's uh, 0 0.025, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and the bracket one is 0 0.025. Oh, sorry, 0 0.05. 0.025 and 0.01 and 0.001. The table that I uploaded in the IVL your luminous, I only give you the first three: 5%, 2.5%, 1%. This one gives you one more value. It's 0.1%. All right. The one in the bracket is 2.5%. So easy to refer to. But mine is okay. So it's one, two, three, four, then seven, eight. After that, 10, 12, 24. And infinity. All right. Okay. So this is the F table. All so this is uh, the one that I just mentioned. All right. How to get? This is the distribution. It's the same as one over F with the degrees of freedom swap. All right. So that help us to find. Oh. All right. Um. So here, this is the degrees of freedom of the numerator, degrees of freedom of the denominator. This is the P. That means I look for a value such that the chance greater than, than that number is 95%. All right. So that means what I'm looking for is an F distribution with 10 and 5 degrees of freedom such that this value so that the probability greater than it is 95%. What's this value? I can look for a F distribution, but with 5 and 10 degrees of freedom, and I look for this value, look for this value, all right, this value, such that the probability greater than it is 5%. But after you got this value, which is 3.33, you have to take the reciprocal to get this. So if this is A, this is B, then A is equal to 1 over B. All right, 1 over 3.3. This is 3.33. This is 1 over 3.33. So the answer is 0.3. All right. So that's how we use this property. Okay, remember, this is what I mentioned earlier. So suppose we want to find this probability of an event. This event involves S1 square over S2 square greater than 1.26. So in order to find this probability, you have to ask yourself, what is the distribution of this, this random variable? S1 square is a random variable, S2 square is a random variable, so the ratio again is a random variable. So what is the distribution of this random variable? So what is S1? S1 square is the sample variance of a sample with size N1 equal 25, and S2 is the sample variance of a sample size of 31, taken from a population, uh, two populations. One, the first one is sigma 1 square equal to 10, and the second one is sigma square equal to 15. All right. So uh, I don't know what distribution of this one, but I know the distribution of this one. S1 square divided by 10, S2 square divided by 15. What is the distribution of this one? This is F with degrees of freedom 24, and the second one is 30. I know the distribution of S1 square over sigma 1 square. Divide by S2 square over sigma 2 square. I don't know the distribution of this one. But I know the distribution of this one. Are they the same? They're not the same. But S1 square over S2 square, all right, times 15 over 10. Are these two the same? Yes, right? You just rearrange it. So divide the denominator by 15 means that you multiply the numerator by 15. 
So divide the numerator by 10 means that you divide the, you put 10 as the denominator. So it's like that. Are these two the same? Now it's the same. Because I multiply this inequality both sides by 15 over 10. So it's still the same inequality. But now I know the distribution of this one. So I calculate the distribution, which is F2430, greater than this number. So that's how we do it. All right? And it is 1.89. So I go and look for my table. This one I purposely do it. This number is 5%. But what happens? All right. Uh, let's say, uh, suppose this one is not 1.89, but instead of 2. Uh, so what is the probability? All right. Uh, 10, 15. Uh, sorry, 24, 30. All right, 24, 30. So now let me look at my table. F. 20, 4 and 24 and 30. Ah, so I have 24, 30. Do we have 30? Oh, so it's here. This set of numbers. All right. Greater than 2, uh, I don't see the 2 there. But where's 2? Uh? 2 is between these two numbers, right? 2 is between these two numbers. If it's almost like the center of uh, made the it is the midpoint of these two numbers, between these two numbers. So take the average now, 5% and 2.5%. So greater than 2 with probability equal to the average of these two numbers. So it's 0 .3, 0 0.0375, lah, right? So in other words, the chance greater than 2, instead of 1.89, for example, is 2. Then what is the probability? I cannot tell you the exact probability, but I can tell you that I roughly estimate it is 3.75%. How I get that number? Because 2 is somewhere between 1.89 and 2.14. It's somewhere in between these two. Quite equal distance from these two numbers. So the probability is the between 2.5% and 5%. It's not the exact answer, all right? But uh, it gives you a good approximation, all right? So what happens if uh, it's inside 1.89 or 2? It is 3. Uh? So what is the probability? Uh? The same example, not 1.89, not 2, but 3. It's still the same distribution, but then what is the probability? I don't know. No, I, I don't accept, I don't know answer. <laughs> you, you cannot give the exact, exact answer, give a rough idea. So here, 3 is bigger than 2.47. So what I can say is that the probability is less than 1%, right? I give you a, a bang. It cannot be, cannot be um, bigger than 1%. Because bigger than 2.7 is 1%. Uh, your 3 is even further away from 2.47. So the chance is less than 1%, all right? Based on the information given now, uh, all right? So, um, so my point is, yes, put away your calculator, put away your computer. If you have such situations, how to deal with it? I don't know. Yeah, that's the easy answer. You've got zero marks. So I cannot give you an exact answer. I try to give you some idea. So I give you a bang, 1%. I know that the probability is less than 1%. If you're asking me what's the chance that the ratio of the S1, S square, S1 square, S2 square, in that example, greater than three, instead of greater than 1.89. Okay, so um, is that the last page? 87. Yeah, this is the last page. Good. Okay, so uh, yeah, chapter six. I still have uh, 15 minutes. Okay, chapter six and chapter seven are. are we discuss how to draw conclusion, or we call it statistical inference from the sample. Okay, the whole idea is that we have this population. If you 
you know everything about this population. Or like, for example, I want to know the population mean. All right? The population. Mu. If I can study everyone, all right, like I want to know the, the, the average score, uh, average G, uh, CAP of those students taking this module. So my population, my population is all the students taking SC2334. I want to know the average CAP. So what I can do is to, to, to get the CAP for every student and then take the average. That's the answer, right? I have only, for this group, I have 250. Even the whole, all the student in lecture groups one, two, and three, they are about 450, not that big, all right? But how about if my population is the whole university, NUS? Do you know how big the population size? No, uh, uh, maybe I set this as exact questions, uh, right? Uh, what's your what, what, what do you think about the pop what, what do you estimate the population size? Uh, give me an estimate of the population size of NUS students. But anyway, it's, it's about, about uh, for undergraduates about, if I'm not wrong, it's about 20 something thousand. All right, or 30,000. The whole population of NUS student population is quite big. All right. But if I want a CAP of all the NUS students or undergraduate students, it's a lot. So I have to ask everyone to get their CAP. Okay, maybe it's still manageable. Huh? How about all the university, all Singapore universities? How many universities in Singapore? Two, uh, one, NUS. No, yeah, <laughs> it's wrong, okay. Two, no, three, no, four, five, five, huh? So at this moment, the uh, uh, government, uh, what, what do the word, that means they, they take the government fund, I think they're five, but going to have six, right? One, two, three, four, okay. So what I mean is that I, I take, now I expand my population to cover all the Singapore universities, so it's even bigger. All right, so my point is there's sometimes you may reach a point that you may not able to investigate everyone in the population. So what we can do is to take a subset, take a subset of the population. But you must do it right. Huh? You must take a random sample. Remember in chapter five, it just finished. So we take a random sample. So make sure that you take a random sample, make sure that um, that means each individual are selected independently, I mean selected so that it's uh, random, randomly so guaranteed that they are independent and identically distributed. And then we study the sample. So now the question is, how to, how to, draw, how to draw conclusion from a subset of the values to the whole population? I think one famous example is, you, you must heard about this, uh, like, the, the polls, um, okay, whether, very make it simple. Um, so like uh, the reason that, that uh, for example, uh, the Thai, uh, Thailand, the Thai state just uh, vote uh, for the government, all right, to select uh, the government or MPs. So now my simple question is that, okay, look at this population. How, what, let, let me, want, I want to know what's the proportion of population that vote for party A, for example. All right, so I want to know. So unless I ask everyone in the population, do you vote for party A or you do vote for other parties? So unless get everyone. But uh, in fact, uh, you don't have to ask everyone. You just take a random sample. If you, you do it correctly, even 1,000 or two or 3,000, is sufficient to represent the whole population. <gasps> wow, how can you do that? Yeah. Of course, we allow some error. It's not the perfect answer, but we allow a, 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 a margin of error. Usually, the margin of error is within 
two, three percentage. If you choose a sample size, maybe 2,000, we can work it out. So my point is, yes, if you learn your statistics, you don't have to check everyone in the population and you're still able to give some idea, some answers to what you want to know. For example, the proportion of as, uh, people vote for a party all right, in, a pop, in, in a country. All right? so, um, so that's why you have to learn statistics. Right? Okay, so but how was, how, okay, this chapter five is based on something called estimation. Chapter, says, chapter seven, the next chapter, is on testing hypothesis, all right? Um, estimation is a very useful technique. That means it tries to provide you with a guess, uh, and, uh, an estimate. We call it estimate, but basically it's a, a, a guess, your guess, based on the data, based on a sample, all right? While well, hypothesis testing is to, to decide, you make a decision, whether you, you, you do not reject or reject certain statement about the population. The most common one is mu equal to certain values, all right? Or p equal to certain values. You take a sample and then try to, based on the sample, try to look at, try, try to conclude uh, whether you reject or do not reject the statement. So that one is called hypothesis testing. And a lot of the research paper, in fact, okay, a lot of research done, uh, you may heard about this, the p-value, so they, they will, uh, I say that, okay, I discovered something because the p-value is very small. So that is part of the hypothesis testing. But the latest development is some scientists question, not, not scientists, but some researchers in different areas question about the use of p-value. We'll talk about p-value in chapter seven. All right, so for chapter six, we talk about estimation. All right, estimate, estimate the value. Give some idea what the value about, or, or about the population. But we also limit to our discussion, our discussion into the situation where the data come from a normal population. So the population assumed to follow normal distribution, okay? Maybe if they're not, but then if you are talking about only the population mean and the sample means, then you may still able to draw some inference about it. All right, so what we are going to do is the point estimation, <laughs> parameter and statistics, unbiased estimator, interval estimator, confidence interval for the mean, sample size, and confidence interval for the difference between the two means. So we try to get an interval to estimate mu, try to get an interval to estimate mu one minus mu two, things like that. And confidence interval for sigma square and confidence interval for the ratio of the two variances. All right, this is what we are going to discuss. All right, now remember we are talking about a distribution or population, all right? A population, and there's some, something in the population, all right? Represent, okay. The behavior of this population is described by the probability function or probability density function, or the value is considered as a random variable. Okay, so for example, the height of the population. So it means that this height of everyone in this population will have certain behavior. It's described by the, the distribution. And the distribution is uh, tried to represent by a function, f of x. It can be a probability function, can be a probability density function. It depends on what the range of your x or the value or the, the character of your x. Okay, so we have a population, okay, represent, is represent by a distribution like that. Then there's some characteristics. So usually the most common one is the expectation of x, which is denoted by mu. The next one is, these are the two common, common characteristics that we are like to uh, investigate. The mean of the population and the variance of the population. These two quantities are the one that we are most um, likely to be, to, to find out or to know more about it, all right? Now, this one is the f of x, all right? 
But now I try to incorporate one more arguments in this f of x. Means that it depends on the theta. If you recall, for example, exponential distribution is one over lambda e to the power minus x over lambda. So it's a function of x as well as lambda. X is the value of the random variable. While lambda is a constant, a constant, it indicates or characterizes the exponential distribution. Different lambda gives you different exponential distribution. Like um, All right, this one is the PDF. PDF of what? Huh? Did you recognize that? Of what distribution? Huh? It's a normal distribution. And what is the mean? Huh? Zero. What is the variance? Huh? One. All right, so this is the PDF of a standard normal. So for normal distribution, it is like this. Sigma exponential minus x minus mu square over two sigma square. So there are three, it's a function of three arguments. X, which is the value of the random variable, mu and sigma. Mu, in fact, is the mean. Sigma is the, sigma square is the variance. All right, so for normal distribution, so, so f of x, can be considered as, I mean, this is the PDF, sigma square. X, mu, and sigma square. So these are the other function in your PDF or probability function, but they are constant, all right? It's part of the probability function or probability density function, but your, your probability function or density function involve only X. X, X is the value of the random variable. The others are just, constants to identify the distribution. So these are called parameters. These are called parameters, all right? So, so these parameters, if it's known, you know the, what is the, the value, then you don't need to estimate. You know the answer. The problem is that you don't know. For example, I'd say, okay, this is from a normal distribution with mean mu and variance one. Then you know that this is a distribution, but you don't know what mu is. So how to get the mu? So we take a sample of size n and look at it and then try to, usually we get the sample mean and use the sample mean to estimate the mu, all right? So the objective is to look at a random sample, okay? So these are the value of the random sample and then we try to get this idea of this theta. Theta is the parameter, all right? So this x lowercase referring to the observed value. That means they are, they are, they are numbers. But instead of writing numbers, I use a, use a lowercase to indicate the values. While the capital letters refer to the random variable. All right. So we try to estimate based on, based on this random sample or function of this random variables to estimate theta. So that is the idea. All right. So it is quite mathematical. Huh? So here, this notation means that it is a function of the random samples. So an example is like this. All right, so this is an example of a function of the random variables x1 up to xn. So we use this to estimate theta, all right? so. Um, so that one we call an estimator, all right. And there are two types of estimation. One is pawn estimation, the other is interval estimation. So it's very simple, okay? So once I collect a sample, based on a sample, I give you one number, all right? How to get this number is based on the estimator to tell you. So like for example, I want to know the average CAP of this class. Then I take a sample of 20, get their CAP, take the average. And then I tell you that, oh, I estimate the population CAP is by that number. Well, interval estimate is that I'm going to construct an interval, an interval, right? 
high, uh, upper limit and lower limit. So that I will tell you that, okay, uh, this is the interval that I'm going to estimate the true average CAP of this population. All right. So for example, I take the, take the sample. Then I find that the sample mean is, let's say, 4.2. Then I will tell you, okay, I estimate this class, the average CAP for the whole class is 4.2. So I give you one number to estimate that. I may have some, I, some, some tools to figure out that, okay, I got 4.2 as the average. So I may plus or minus something. All right. Maybe, okay, let's say I, I say that, okay, the CAP of this class may be between 4.2 minus 0.2 plus uh, 4.2 plus 0.2. So in other words, I'm telling you, okay, I believe that the CAP of this whole class is between 4 and 4.4. 4 and 4.4. Of course, we uh, this study how we got this, but that will be an interval. I use this interval, all right, to tell you, give you some idea what is the true population mean. So I believe that I give you this interval, so I'm quite confident that the, the, the true mu may be covered by this interval. All right, so that's the interval estimate. All right, so um, we'll, we'll cover all this. I mean, we'll discuss this in the next lecture. All right, so start our journey of doing inference from the sample to the population. Okay, thank you.